My might is unmatched in this land. How far does a man travel in the name of another? How much would he sacrifice for the benefit of a shared dream? Long ago, there lived a warrior in the Kingdom of Wei, whose only desire was to aid his cousin on his path of conquest, to reach a land of peace and order. He fought for the sake of his friends, and would give his life if the need arose. He was one who would follow his lord to the edge of oblivion, no matter the cost. The Codex opens to the story of Shaho Dun. of the latter Han dynasty lived and died for the sake of their loyalties, but there were those rare few who wore such bonds like badges of honor and thrived on the strength they gave. Few other officers paragoned this ideal more than Shaho Dun. Any foe who saw his face on the battlefield knew he fought with the full strength of his allies at his back and that he was closely related to the first emperor of Wei, Cao Cao. From his earliest days through the turmoil of the Han Empire's collapse, Shaho Dun fought alongside his cousins, Shaho Yuan and Cao Cao, and all three lived through numerous bloody battles. In spite of this, Shaho Dun never let down his guard, for he saw something in Cao Cao that made him swear his life in service of a young lord. Put simply, his faith in him was unwavering and as a result, he swore that he would stand as Cao Cao's right hand for as long as his life allowed. Originally born in the region of Chao, Shaho Dun grew up as a descendant of Shaho Ying, a legendary warrior, and was raised with his cousins from birth. As children, the three formed an adamant friendship as they were trained in the martial arts by masters at arms. Though his outward demeanor was stoic and cool, inside burned the flame of a warrior of immense skill, and he was quick to reveal it whenever he got the chance to fight unabated. For years, he traveled with Cao Cao and Shaho Yuan throughout the land, visiting villages and towns impoverished by the greed of the declining Han court, even if they themselves weren't of noble stock. This unrest culminated in the Yellow Turban Rebellion in 184 AD, and Dun witnessed firsthand the violence they committed in the name of their so-called Way of Peace. Disgusted, he pledged along with his comrades that they would put an end to the uprising, and joined various other generals in the coming fight. The martial prowess he displayed during the latter battles was recognized heavily by the other generals, and Cao Cao himself gained major renown for his strategic acuity and knowledge of warfare. Thus, Shaho Dwin earned his place in the young kingdom of Wei, and became a permanent staple of the clan's prestigious roster. The five generals of Wei were also led by him, including the likes of Zhang He, Xu Huang, and Zhang Liao. Soon enough, he would be counted amongst the most loyal and skilled warriors in the entire Three Kingdoms era. Following the defeat of the Yellow Turban leaders, the rebels scattered away, and the warlords returned to their respective lands. Cao Cao, however, had other desires, and sought to unite the country under his rule in due time. Sha Ho Dun stood beside him with unflinching loyalty, even if he wondered how his lord would conquer China on his own. 
His first taste of ambition came when Wei Hong, a Han minister, tasked Cao Cao with assassinating Dong Zhuo, a corrupt and greedy official who had wormed his way into the court culture. Unfortunately, he failed in his attempt, and Xiao Dun was there with Yuan to help their lord escape, and both vowed to keep him safe in the days ahead. Around a year later, Dun fought on the fields of Hulao Pass, crossing blades with the likes of Hua Xiang and even Lu Bu, but his true target was Dong Zhuo. The poorly lord narrowly escaped his defeat, but Xiao Dun taunted him to try and fight back. Cao Cao proved his mettle in that battle, and it was there that his journey of conquest truly began. For Xiao Dun, on the other hand, it was a glimpse of the various warlords from other armies, how they fought, who led them, and more importantly, the danger they posed to Cao Cao. The years that followed were some of the most tumultuous for the young warriors, with Cao Cao clashing in numerous battles leading up to his confrontation with his longtime friend Yuan Shao. In the aftermath of Hulao Pass, Lu Bu had murdered Dong Zhuo and fled the capital of Luoyang with a small band of loyal officers. Subsequently, Lu Bu's wandering led him to the lands of Yan, which at the time was controlled by Cao Cao, though the Lord was preoccupied with invading Shu province with the bulk of his army. Upon hearing news of the attack, Cao Cao dispatched Xiao Dun, Xiao Yuan, and Yue Jin to assist the isolated Shun Yo to drive out Lu Bu's forces. Though the fort was nearly overtaken, Dun and his allies fought their way to Shun Yo. But the single moment he let down his guard was all it took to wound both his body and heart in one stroke. <laughs> He reeled in pain at first, but in a moment of steel will, he regained himself and plucked the arrow, taking his eye with it. He declared that his eye was a small price to pay for the sake of his lord, for the light he would bring to the benighted world. Though he still bled, he swallowed the eye, not wanting to throw away the blood of his family over such an injury, and he pressed on with the battle. Soon enough, Cao Cao himself arrived with reinforcements, and Lu Bu was driven out of Puyang with the remains of his army. Cao Cao noticed Xiao Dun's injury and praised him for his strength and fortitude, trusting no one else to be at his side in battle. Since that day, he donned a patch over his eye, a mark of remembrance, but also a message to his foes that he was not so easily defeated. Several years later, Lu Bu's forces were cornered in Xiaopi Castle, located in Shu Province, and Cao Cao was forced to ally with Liu Bei in order to face the enemy. Though he could have ignored Lu Bu as a brute with no ambition, Cao Cao and Xiao Dun both agreed that a monster like him could not be allowed to rampage as he pleased, especially after he usurped control of Shu Province in Liu Bei's absence. Dune fought like a hungry wolf, his single eye seeing all that he needed to cut through his foes, and soon enough, Lu Bu was brought before Cao Cao in chains. Dune presided over his cousin's judgment of the wayward demon, and for the first time, doubted his choice of words. Asking for Lu Bu's loyalty in exchange for his life, Lu Bu gruffly refused, shouting insults at the Wei Lord. In a last moment of defiance, he attempted to attack Cao Cao, but the general's blade struck him down even before Xiao Dun could react. In the stillness, he knew his cousin's heart was strong, and that no other man in the world could earn the title Hero of Chaos. The following year, Cao Cao found himself clashing with Liu Bei, a man he saw as an equal in skill and intellect, but due to a misunderstanding over the death of his father Cao Song, Cao Cao fought for control of Shu province. Liu Bei was swiftly defeated and forced to flee, but Guan Yu, his second sworn brother, stayed behind to cover his escape. Impressed with Guan Yu's courage, Cao Cao offered him a place in his army, promising that he would be treated well, much to Xiao Dun's dismay. He saw little reason to trust the Shu warrior, much less one so loyal to his brothers, but he bowed his head in compliance as they left the battlefield. In the time that followed, Guan Yu and Xiao Dun developed a somewhat fractured rivalry, and the two of them clashed often despite how well Cao Cao received him as a guest. 
Feeling marginalized and concerned for his cousin's safety, Doon kept his eye on Guan Yu in the time before the Battle of Guan Du, in which Cao Cao at last squared off with Yuan Shao for control of the Northern Lands. In spite of this, Guan Yu left Cao Cao's side when the battle ended to return to Liu Bei, and Xiao Ho Dun sought to hunt him down. He believed Guan Yu posed a greater threat than Cao Cao imagined, but his cousin forbade him from pursuing, saying that his debt was paid for the safety of Liu Bei. From that day forth, Xiao Ho Dun held a grudge against the so-called God of War for years after Yuan Shao's defeat, and his anger carried him through a myriad of battlefields in Wei's history, from Changban to the highly contested Jing province. He was also present during Cherbi. Even if he couldn't stop the fire attack from consuming the Wei fleet, he still fought at Cao Cao's side while he withdrew. For over a decade later, the warrior who was sometimes called Blind Shaho crossed swords with many heroes across mainland China and witnessed the fall of just as many clans. Through it all, however, his vendetta toward Guan Yu never faded. Eventually, the kingdoms of Wei, Wu, and Shu had rooted themselves in their respective lands, and tensions came to a head in the central province of Jing once more. Despite being controlled by Cao Cao, Fan Castle was besieged by Guan Yu and his forces, driving out Cao Ren and seizing the fort for Shu. Hearing word of this, Cao Cao dispatched his elite generals led by Xia Ho Dun, and they rode hard to rescue the isolated Wei troops. They arrived alongside Lu Meng of Wu and his respective generals, with both sides seeing mutual benefit in eliminating Guan Yu for good. Utilizing the heavy rain to their advantage, Xia Ho Dun and the others destroyed a massive levee to flood Fan Castle, forcing Guan Yu to retreat. As the storm raged around them, Dun pursued the god of war, hungry to face him, and Guan Yu was soon cornered. The rain pelted down their blades their faces locked in the stillness. Two warriors meant to walk different paths converged for one last time. In the end, Xia Ho Dun finally struck down Guan Yu, though with his last words, he declared that he was a warrior worthy of Cao Cao's trust, and that it was an honor to have met him. When the war god fell, Xia Ho Dun felt a heavy weight on his heart finally lift away. Soon after, he returned to his homeland, his vendetta fulfilled and passed away peacefully soon after Cao Cao. Much like the warriors of old, Xia Ho Dun's visage is one of focus and disciplined martial might that reflects both his upbringing and his strong will. In spite of his handicap, he still chooses to don full armor and cloth in battle, keeping his eye covered with a leather patch. As with other officers of Wei, his main color is deep blue with highlights of gold, which can show his high stature as a general, much like Cao Cao's dress. Since Dynasty Warriors 3, this coloration has remained the same, with the only deviation being Dynasty Warriors 7, in which he resembled a darker blue. In the most recent game, he's retained his gruff exterior, but has gained more armor to showcase his position as an officer, along with the trailing robe to showcase his upper class nature. Of course, the most distinctive piece he wears is his eye patch both a reminder of his injury and a promise to fight through any pain for the sake of his cousin's ambition. What's more, his iconic status in the series overall has led him to be featured in many of the game's opening cinematics, and he is seldom missing from any scene with the other generals of Wei as a result. Even as an abrasive and often impatient man, Xia Ho Dun was well liked by his comrades, both for his martial skill and his decisive command over his forces in battle. This is to say nothing of his fortitude, which led him to shrug off a wound that would have killed a normal man, and prove henceforth that his soul burned with the strength of a thousand men. 
Even so, the strength did earn him a fair share of enemies, particularly Guan Yu, Lu Bu, and Jia Xu, all of whom he distrusted greatly. Jia Xu, in particular, was the only officer to ever regain decent standing with Dun, since his attempted assassination of Cao Cao and killing of Dian Wei tore a rift between the two. He was only redeemed during the Battle of Xia Pi, where his tactics helped bring them victory. In spite of this, Xia Ho Dun held his ground for the sake of Cao Cao's judgment, and that trust granted him plenty of favor. Guan Yu, on the other hand, was outright despised by Xia Ho Dun, even after he left Cao Cao's side, seeing him as a terrible threat to his lord. Yet through the tension, Guan Yu regarded Dun as a worthy opponent, even though they were on opposite sides. Conversely, he was very close with Xia Ho Yuan, and the two always watched each other's backs while they were in battle. As one of the five generals of Wei, a group of decorated warriors, he was on good terms with the likes of Zhang Liao, Xu Huang, and Cao Ren, all of whom he fought with during the Battle of Fan Castle. Beneath his abrasive and short-tempered exterior lied a man that was eager to be accepted by his comrades, and to show them the loyalty he believed they deserved. Yet, the same perspective made him hold grudges against his foes so strong that oceans and mountains could never separate them. No pain was too great for the sake of his beliefs, and no enemy too strong to shake his resolve. For a man scorned as a blind vagrant, Xia Ho Dun burned and scraped his story into legend by the edge of his broadsword, and let no one deter him from fighting for his goals. Though he's not among my favorites, there are few warriors in the Dynasty Warriors canon that I admire as much as him, both for his strength of character and his will to live through a crippling injury as if it had never happened, all for the sake of those dear to him. Perhaps little else could be asked of any friend who charges into the fire at your side, yet will always give their life to keep you safe. Next time, the pages will turn to a heroine revered as the Bow Princess the daughter of the tiger of Jiangdong, and a living scion to the Sun family of Wu. Though derided for her gender, this tigress bears her fangs against all those who would challenge her. I am the Eastern Fox. As always, be safe on your journeys, and fight on. <laughs>